everyone. Welcome back for a brand new edition of Collider Dailies. It is our Wednesday edition. John, why does every day this week feel like Friday? I think it just, it's because Christmas is coming up. And so like, we're all ready to just, you know, take some time <laughs> off and kick it, you know. I'm working through the week next week. I'm not taking any time off. I just got Friday brain every day. Well, that's, I mean... With you, that doesn't really surprise me. You're you're no. one of the most hardworking people I know. Yeah. Like, are you are you though taking some time at least to relax a little bit? I guess so. I mean, the fact that the fact that interviews are are mostly done for the year, and that means you know I, I don't have to like fully get dressed to go out to junkets. I think that automatically means it's like a little bit of a downtime vibe. I could sit in sweatpants for two weeks. I mean, I'm in sweatpants pretty much every day. I'm actually in sweatpants right now. But Literally in sweatpants right now as well. <laughs> I just, I, I think that everybody, regardless of who they are, what they do, what they celebrate, anything like that, should take some time around this time of year, maybe not necessarily on Christmas Day, but whatever day they want to, to just like relax and, you know, do something, do something for them and them alone, something meant to make them smile. So I hope that you are finding some time to do that. I think that's a pretty good rule. And I, I, I'm willing to abide by that. What I would recommend is that if anybody wants to take some me time over the holiday, they spend that time by seeing a good movie in the movie theaters because there's a lot of really good stuff out right now. There's a lot of really good stuff. This will take us into our first story nicely, which is a holiday box office preview. And, you know, it's like it's not looking it's not looking too hot for a lot of big titles right now. Some of them are are shaping up to to have some pretty strong performances over the holiday weekend. But the thing is, and, and I'm mostly referring to a deadline article that broke down the the holiday weekend box office. And one thing they point out is that unlike past Christmas weekends at the box office, there's no like major, major tentpole movie, something like a Star Wars or an Avatar, Spider-Man No Way Home. There is nothing like that that is going to do that like sky high business that winds up spilling over into the new year, which also starts the new year off on the right foot, which not having that is kind of problematic because the prediction right now is that they're going to see a, a 10% drop at the box office next year because of uh, strike delays. So things are things are kind of like going out with a whimper and they might not start off too great in 2024 at the box office either. <laughs> yeah, I think the closest thing to a tent pole that we have this holiday season would probably be Aquaman. And I mean, who like... I liked the first Aquaman, do not get me wrong, but I I cannot think of anybody that I know who is chomping at the bit to go see that movie. Like no one is like super hyped to go see that movie. I'm I the, the main reasons I'm excited to see Aquaman is because I see every James Gunn movie. I love him as a filmmaker and just as a force in this industry, and I I like the idea of Jason Momoa and Patrick uh Wilson kind of you know, being an unlikely duo, I think that has a lot of story promise, but I didn't love the first Aquaman. If everybody, if anybody else liked it out there, I respect your opinion, but I'm also a little, a little scarred because that was one of the first times I got extreme internet hate for just not being super high on something. And I'm like mm. a little, little traumatized by that experience. And, you know, I don't, I don't want my, uh, my holiday time to, to wind up in that, that same, like, not so nice space. So I'm I'm steering a little clear of Aquaman right now. That's kind of for me. I got a lot of hate with the sequel trilogy, um, mainly not hating the Last Jedi as much as everyone else did. Yeah. Uh, so I definitely know Jedi. how I that knows it. <laughs> I think the Last I, Jedi is great still. I think of the three, it was the best of that trilogy. Uh, I don't know if I would go so far as to say great. There's definitely issues with it, but. Uh, so I know, I know where you're coming from as far as like internet hate and kind of wanting to steer clear of something, yeah. but That's more than that, like Aquaman, this latest film, I think that there's, there's so much going on with DC that it's kind of, it's, it's sort of kneecapped a little bit with this being the last film in sort of the old DC universe before we get to the James Gunn stuff, uh, it being, you know, 
that Aquaman was never like the biggest character to begin with. And so a lot of people are just like, this seems weird that this is the one that we're ending everything on. There's no big climax. It's just kind of ending. And there's a lot of people who are just like, I'd rather just wait for what's next. Yeah. There's some people who are like, I don't want to watch it because it's just a, it's a nothing ending. It's, it's a weird place to be. It, it does feel a little unfair to the movie and the people involved in making the movie that that iteration of the DC film franchise was cut off before the movie even came out because that automatically puts it at, at a disadvantage. So Deadline is saying that the movie is expected to make about $40 million plus over the four-day Christmas weekend, which, you know, it, it's kind of low. And one thing they do point out in their article is that it would be lower than the Marvel's three-day start of $46.1 million. However, the article also points out that overseas is looking much more promising for the film. It is going to have a 73 market launch, and it's looking to make somewhere between 75 and $80 million, which is a nice chunk of money right there. But, you know, stateside that's not the that's not the hottest opening especially for a superhero movie and especially for a holiday weekend like that so aquaman might not have the strongest opening here well and if i'm not mistaken i'm pretty sure that it was the same kind of story with the first film as well where internationally it was a much better performer than domestically if i remember correctly it's been a while since i've looked at the numbers for that if i open box office mojo right now to check those stats my connection will slow and this video will look like garbage so i'm not doing it it'll look like my video (laughs) i'm on a i'm i'm at my parents give me a break if only i had a sewing room if i had a sewing room dude i would not know how to use it i can do you you like the do you like the the i think that's a quilt that my mom is working on that's lovely i'm very impressed Anyone who my mom does anything. some does some great work. So shout out, <laughs> shout out to shout out to my mother. Uh, <laughs> shout out to your mother always. Um, so the next Indeed. movie on on our list here, based on uh, this deadline article that I'm blowing through right now, is Wonka, which uh, would be in its second weekend this weekend, and they're predicting that it's going to be behind Aquaman two with a four day total in the uh, twenty million dollar range, which feels feels pretty solid to me for a second weekend, and you know. I like I like the movie. It's got good vibes. It's got good holiday season vibes. So I feel like that's gonna fare pretty well. I was planning on seeing it this weekend. So that's, you know, I'll be one of those, you know, twenty million dollars worth of hmm. income that it pulls in. I would recommend I, I, it. I think that being, you know, pulling those kind of numbers in the second week, as you said, that's that's totally reasonable, and that is kind of to be expected. Being a second weekend, it's not going to necessarily like blow up. That being said, Christmas weekend it being more of a family oriented film, it might get a little bit of a boost from that, but you know, it's hard to say. Well, speaking of family films, there's also a new uh, animated movie coming out. It's Migration, and they're predicting that that's going to have a three day total of about $10 million, a four day total of 15 million, which, you know, it's a little low, but the article goes on to, to say that original movies do often have a tougher time at the box office to start. And also universal animated features do tend to have some some nice legs over the holidays. So, you know, for example, they, they point out Puss in Boots last year. Puss in Boots, uh, The Last Witch, debuted with $12.4 million and then did a nearly... 15 times multiplier for a final stateside total of 185.5 million, which is quite significant. I was uh, I was looking through some. I didn't see migration, and I was looking through some uh, some of the early reviews, and the the reviews aren't too hot. Whereas Puss in Boots was exceptional, and I think exceeded many people's expectations. So I don't know if yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna put that much or that same stock in migration, but. You know, given the fact that uh, I believe it's the only new animated feature in theaters. Why don't people know that there's a new Chicken Run movie on Netflix? Everyone, go stay home and watch Chicken Run. Chicken Run, Dawn of the Nugget. It's very good. It's very, very good. It's very good for everybody, for the young kiddos and for the adults in their lives. I feel like... Whether you have kids or not, I'm backtracking. I don't care if you have kids. Watch Chicken Run, Dawn of the Nugget. It's legit good. No As someone who it. is uh, a lifelong fan of the original Chicken Run, so which is good. weird to say, but it's also worth pointing out that movie's like 20 years old it at is. this point. But it, isn't that crazy? After 20 years, we're finally getting a sequel. And that, like, it's still got that same quality and texture to the look of the animation. Like, it's, you know, traditional Ardman style. Yeah. But there's certain modifications as the technology has advanced where, 
I like there's like subtle like details that are just exceptional and make everything feel so real. Yeah, watch Chicken Run. Yeah, <laughs> maybe what you run. should do, or roll or roll the dice on a new animated feature that I, I'll be honest, I know nothing about migration. Oh yeah, I mean, I, I like, haven't even heard about it before I read the article. I always look forward to everything that the studio puts out, but you know, my migration there just hasn't seemed to have been all that much talk about it. And also, like I'm in the zone now where when my niece points something out or my sister suggests I see something with my niece, it becomes a, a higher priority. That that one has not been in the mix. Um, another one we have coming out this week is Anyone But You. That one only cost $25 million to make, and it's got an outlook of $7 million at 3,000 plus theaters this weekend. So that's not half bad. Um, the deadline article notes that streamers have kind of, you know, taken up all the, the rom-com space right now. So uh, Sony, the studio releasing the movie, is looking to give folks a different choice in the movie theaters, and they've had success with that this year. They're the ones who released uh, No Hard Feelings with Jennifer Lawrence, and that movie kicked off its run with $15 million and went on to make... Uh, 50.4 million domestically. So that one did fairly well. Another big one we have coming out this weekend, or at least I thought it was going to be big, or maybe bigger than this number suggests, it's the Iron Claw. So the Iron Claw arrives in 2,500 theaters and is predicted to make $6 million over four days. I just thought with that cast and that subject matter, an A24, I thought the number was going to be a little higher, so that does seem low, but the Deadline article does note that exit polls on the movie were really, really good. Apparently, 90% of the people who were polled said the movie exceeded their expectations, which hmm. could hint at that movie having long legs. And, you know, as important as it is to have a strong showing your first weekend at the box office, the legs are really what matters. So hopefully that's what happens with that film. Well, it's also worth remembering that you said it was 2,500 theaters that it's going to be opening in. That's, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that's a little bit under, I want to say, half of movie theaters in the United States. I think that we're like, it's, it's like still wide. That's still that's pretty the, wide. I mean, that is that is a pretty wide release. But you're talking about it's it's an independent film. Yes, the subject matter is widely popular, but it's not necessarily like every mainstream audience member's cup of tea. Six million does seem a little low, but it doesn't seem that low in my Zach opinion. Zach Efron and Jeremy Allen White, two of the biggest names in this business right now. I don't know. That that seems that seems low to me. I would have I like if they had said like ten or eleven million, I think I that to me would be right on the money. Six does seem a little low, but it doesn't seem like astronomically low. I'm, okay. my mind isn't blown by that prediction. All right. I'm 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 a little shocked by that prediction uh we'll see we'll see what happens with that then we also have uh, a couple movies that are making christmas day uh debuts which could be big for one in particular so this is probably the movie that is uh that's in one of the best shapes i think it's it's the color purple they're predicting that it could outperform its eight million dollar uh predicted total for the day for christmas day with 10 million and the article does note that pre-sales are very hot with that movie and that makes me happy because the movie is real damn good and it deserves a whole lot of box office love. So I'm happy to see it getting that. And then my hopes are that because it was one of the late season entries as far as Oscar buzz goes, I do think that the response it gets at the box office and also just, you know, opinion wise, I think that's going to play into its Oscar chances quite significantly. So with Color Purple, the movie had its first screening. The the reviews, the, not the reviews, at that point it was just reactions. The, re the reactions were very, very positive. It continued to screen. It continued to get more positive reactions. A lot of people started talking about certain individuals' chances at the, uh, at the Oscars this year. And it still feels like I have Color Purple in my number nine spot right now for Best Picture but it's still, it's like in that bubble area where it could get bumped out. However, if the movie performs big at the box office and there's like so much color purple noise that people can't avoid it, that could be what it needs to like boost it into like more sure territory as far as a best picture nomination goes. And I want to see that happen. I want to see it get that nomination so badly. Well, and it, it like, as far as the box office is concerned, it definitely has a leg up being 
you know, because the color purple is a recognizable story. It is a very powerful story that a lot of people hold in very high regard. So there's going to be a lot of people who are going to want to go see this latest version of it. Um, I haven't seen it myself, so I can't necessarily speak to its Oscar chances. Uh, it's on my list of things that I need to watch once it comes out, but it doesn't surprise me that it is something that people are talking about in regards to Oscars, because again, it is a recognizable story that is, as I said, exceptionally powerful, something that a lot of, a lot of people hold very close to their heart. So it makes sense to me. All right. Next up, there's the boys in the boat, George Clooney's new movie. That one is coming out in 2,400 theaters and it's got an outlook of two to 3 million for its Christmas day opening. Hey, I kind of expect that. That feels like it's flying under the radar a little bit, but not as far under the radar maybe as a a, bi a big one, a costly one. This is Ferrari. So the the article says of all the wide releases over the holiday, the one that is uh, looking most likely to disappoint is, is Ferrari, which apparently cost $95 million to make. And right now they're predicting that it's making just $1 million on Christmas Day. It's uh, that's that's rough, especially uh, given the subject matter, given the people involved, given they've had the SAG interim agreement and they've been able to promote it. Like what? What happened? What happened? Uh, I'll be honest. I got the vibe that it felt like they were trying to hide this movie a little bit. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it's I not very good. Um, that is one that I haven't been able to circle back to and catch, not, not because I don't want to see the movie, just because I had a conflicting assignment, but I'm still kind of curious, still kind of want to see it, but I mean, but no, it has, it has some really great people working on it. So it, it has a lot of the ingredients to be able to make a pretty good movie that should be an audience pleaser, but I don't know. Yeah, I, that's... Get, I get a, I get a bad vibe from it. Well, that's one of the ones that, you know, uh, went into award season with Oscar potential simply because of the people involved in the subject matter. You know, the, the it was packaged like an Oscar movie. So yeah. the assumption is that it has a chance. And then after early screenings, those chances kind of faded away quite quickly. So it does look like that's going to happen with its box office total as well. We shall see. All right. Briefly, our second story here, because this is something that just broke before we went live. I'm going to read a little from the Collider.com article about the People's Joker getting a theatrical release. The article says copyright issues may have seen the People's Joker pulled from the Toronto International Film Festival last year, but that won't keep the parody DC title out of theaters. Altered Innocence, a Los Angeles-based distributor known for giving a platform to queer and coming-of-age stories, has acquired Vera Drew's film. The company will bring the completely unlicensed project to the big screen next year on April 5th. I am excited to hear this. I was one of the lucky few to see it out of TIFF uh, 2022, and I, th I thought it was I thought it was quite good. I really I really enjoy when people take popular properties and they use them in a way to reflect their own story and to highlight what they connect to most about those popular properties. And I thought this movie did that in a really unique way. And I'm, I'm also thinking back to the interview that I conducted for it and what a production challenge and feat the movie felt like too. Like they, they created, I, I, I believe like everything from scratch using a significant amount of green screen. And it's one of those movies that really can only exist if every single person involved, one knows what they're making, but also is willing to give something like that 110%. Because if you don't have a team of people around you willing to support that vision, it's, it's just an impossible thing to pull off. And it does seem like Vera assembled that kind Kind of team here so i'm happy that this movie is not only going to see the light of day but see it on the big screen i mean i'm super thrilled about it too i didn't get a chance to see it but i heard enough people talking about it when we were at fantastic fest it was a conversation piece that a lot of people brought up uh because we actually saw vera in the debate the boxing debates uh so there was a lot of talk about their work and things of that nature 
to me, this film is a prime example of why the public domain needs to be a wider thing. Because movies like this and just stories like this, art pieces like this, are the kind of thing that, that can exist in a much safer bubble if things are actually allowed to fall into the public domain. We we had an episode of dailies where myself and Maggie kind of ranted on this a little bit, or rather it was me ranting and Maggie put up with my rant uh, <laughs> talking about how copyright protect protections are far too long. 95 years is way too long for something to be not in the public domain because once something falls in the public domain, it belongs to the people and the people are able to take it and are able to tell stories with it or able to use it to like build new things. If, if Batman or other DC characters were in the public domain, we would probably get a lot more pieces like this without having to worry about, you know, whatever legal issues this movie ran into. I don't know the specific details, but I can imagine based upon, what I know about the movie, it would just be great to be able to see more of this kind of stuff because such an inventive idea, such a, a, a great creative outlet, being able to use a lot of these fantastic characters that everyone knows and twist them and turn them into something new and use them for whatever you're trying to say is fantastic. And we, I want to see more of that, but we're, we're in a space as a society where, that's easier said than done. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, I mean, this won't Any directly them, change <laughs> those, those rules and regulations, but I do think, uh, you know, Vera Drew and the team standing firm and pushing forward and making sure the movie is seen is definitely a nice step forward. All right. Our final story of the day is a review. We're reviewing Percy Jackson and the Olympians, the new series on Disney plus. I have had the pleasure of seeing a couple of episodes, I think a little more than what's available. So it actually dropped early on Disney Plus. I was so excited. I was literally messaging you, John. And I was yeah. like, like, will you be able to watch it in time if it dropped when originally planned, which I think was, was something like midnight. And then as I was writing that to you, news broke that the episodes were out and we could watch them. So yeah, we and watched I, them. I immediately started watching them like as and soon as we got done messaging. <laughs> what so. did you think? I really liked it. Here's here's the thing. I'm not a big Percy Jackson fan. I, I feel like I was a little old when the books came out, so I didn't read them because I was in like later parts of high school, so I wasn't really looking at young adult books to be reading. So I was never a big Percy Jackson fan. <laughs> what was that there's face for? Because there's... I don't care. Yes, how, there's a lot of I fantastic young adult stuff. I don't care how old I get. I will always be drawn to young adult novels. <laughs> I, I, I agree with you now. 16, 17, 18 year old John wouldn't okay, that's, have that opinion. That's fair. That's fair. Yeah. When like it, when you don't know and you might be I'm too cool to like read this young yeah, adult book. All right, I get it. I get it. <laughs> and I saw the I saw the two films that we got when they came out, and I wasn't super thrilled by them, but I I love the concept of this story. So when I heard that there was going to be a TV series, I immediately kind of piped up a little bit because to me, this seems like something. This world needs a little bit more time to breathe and a little bit more time to be fleshed out than a movie allows for. So giving it a, a series, even if it's just like a short series for, uh, for the one book is going to allow the world to feel a little bit more lived in a little bit more fleshed out. There's going to be a little bit more understanding to the, why things are the way they are. And it's just going to, I think it's just going to be better for the story that's trying to be told to be given that little bit of that little bit of space to mm -hmm. breathe and spread out a little. I am very into this show thus far. I like, I'm not going to tell you I'm the biggest Percy Jackson fan, but I did read the first two books when the other movies came out and, you know, I didn't love, I didn't love those movies, especially the second one, but I did think the first one was, was fine. It was solid enough you can really feel the difference in this, though, with Rick Riordan's um, heavier involvement here. And I do also think, as much as I love the actors who played the leads, I think they're all very talented in those original two movies. There's 
there's something that happens when you cast actors closer to the character's age that makes it feel like more, more honest, more lived in, more authentic. And that's what happens when you have um, Percy Jackson, of course, here is played by Walker Scobell, who I think is just one of the most talented young actors out there. Just whether it's a dialogue driven moment or just a look on his face, I think he is naturally capable of saying so much with less, which I think is very effective in this series in terms of making it feel grounded and real, even when all these fantastical things are happening around him. I think he is great. Leah Jeffries is playing Annabeth here. I think she's excellent too. She did that uh, Idris Elba movie, which is one of the first things that I had seen her. And I'm like, oh, you are good. You, you've got what it takes to be here. And, and sure enough, she's giving me that same impression in this show. And then I also think um, Aryan Simhadri is great as Grover too. And that's a curious character to play, given the fact that he looks like he's as young as the others, but really he's 24. And I feel yeah. like he, he walks that line between feeling part of the group, but also like he's got you know, this additional knowledge very, very well. I just, like, I love the three of them. I think a lot of the visual effects look real damn good. There's a couple of things in the in the first episode. Like, uh, I love the, the Mrs. Dodd stuff at the beginning in particular. Oh, yeah. Just, like, the first part of the reveal, like, the way she moves her arms. I'm, like, a little obsessed with that shot. I think it looks real good. And re really everything after that, I think it's, it's all solid stuff. And as far as the beginning of a series goes, I think these first few episodes suggest that we, we could have a real winner here. Yeah. I really want to talk about the production design because mm -hmm. I love everything about the camp feels fantastic to me. It, it simultaneously looks like a place where if I was going to summer camp, that's what it would look like while at the same time, still having that very Greek influence, uh, still feeling very mystical while also grounded in reality to a certain degree. I, I just feel like it was so like the, the tiny details of the world just feel a lot more real and a lot more lived in than I was expecting from just a, you know, from a, from a series where you got to stretch a budget a little bit further mm -hmm. than a movie would. Uh, I just think that it is fantastic. And a lot, you know, you were speaking to the CGI. I think the CGI looks great. The, also the monster design is just really great. That, I believe it was a harpy was what Mrs. Dodds was. That's a harpy, right? I'm trying to remember my Greek oh, mythology. God, don't ask me terms, man. <laughs> I thought that she looked fantastic when, when that reveal happened and, and she just like unraveled and uncoiled into this monstrous thing. I like, I had to pause for a second because I was just like, that looks almost too good. And then the Minotaur also just looked fantastic at the end mm -hmm. of the first episode. The whole thing, it just looks great. Like it is so much more higher budget and higher quality than I anticipated it being. And it just, it, it, it tickled me. Yeah, I'm, I'm very, I'm very into it. I do think everything looks really good. But then again, you know, the other major thing you need in order to sell all that stuff is great performances. And there's one other that I really want to emphasize here. Virginia Cole, who plays Percy's mother, because oh, that, yeah. that is a vital relationship to establish very quickly to reflect history and also this this intense sense of loss given what she has on the line in this episode. And, you know, when you only have like ultimately like 35 minutes to do that, probably a little less if you start counting her screen time in particular, what she's able to sell with the uh, Walker Scobell is, is really, really powerful and effective. So I just want to give her a little round of applause. Job well done. I think that particular relationship is vital to starting this series off on the right foot. And they very much did. She was very much the highlight of the first episode for me. Like as soon as she came on screen, I just, I bought her as, as his mother and the moment where she was sitting there with Grover, like making him swear to her. I like that. I felt that like she put her whole, her whole chest into that performance. It was so good. Yeah. Some, some really powerful work across the board. I'm excited to see this, uh, 
the story unfolds in this particular format and where they go, where they go from here. And also just, you know, the audience response, because again, I'm not going to say that I'm the biggest Percy Jackson fan. I have not read the entire series. I'm familiar with the source material. Again, I've read the first two books, but there's a lot of people out there who really, really love these stories. And I know it was really important to them to see a faithful adaptation. And I'm getting the sense that this is that. So I am especially excited to kind of get out there and see how they're responding to it. Because as someone who has felt that way about other book series, I know how important it could be. Like you have to take creative license sometimes, but you want to feel like the thing that you love was honored and respected. And I just hope that it makes them feel that way. So We'll see. We'll see how things go from here. Yeah. I hope from what I've seen, I love it again. I, I think that it being a series, maybe they'll be able to avoid cutting so much from the book. Cause I know that that was a complaint with the first film was that it deviated hmm. in some pretty large ways from the book. So I'm really hoping that the series is able to avoid that. And that, because I know that Percy Jackson fans have been very vocal about wanting a good adaptation and hopefully this is it for them. I think that again, as an outsider looking in, it definitely seems like it, but we'll see what the fans have to say. Yes. I look forward to watching more with that. That is a wrap on today's dailies episode. John, is there anything you want to promote plug before we go? I mean, just be sure to be getting over to collider.com and checking out all of our uh, wonderful article videos that we've been putting up. Uh, we have a team of people who have been creating uh, videos for some of our like best performing articles. So you can get over there. You can check those out. We actually put up a video yesterday that I, that I personally worked on, which was uh, the top 30 movies of 2023. Mm. Uh, the article is fantastic, and the video that goes with it is not too shabby, if I do say so myself. You can you can actually check that one out over on YouTube as well, if you want to take a look at that. Uh, yeah. Good stuff. It's, we I'll, got some good stuff coming. I'll take a moment to to promote the, uh, the future of dailies, because, again, we were talking about holiday movies. Christmas is on Monday, but... You will have a show on Monday, and it's a show yes. I'm especially excited for because we're going to do a Collider Dailies White Elephant Gift Exchange. I'm really curious to see how this goes virtually. Yeah. We're going to make it work, though. We're going to make it work. I, and then... I think up? the biggest thing about that episode for me and the thing that I am the most excited about is it is going to be the first time that we are going to have everybody on one episode at once. No. Oh, we're not? We're going to have four not? of us. It's going to be me. It's going to be me, you, Maggie, and uh, Adam. Oh, okay. We'll have four. It's the first time we're going to use the quad box. Still. We're very excited about that. And then Either after, way. And then after that, throughout the week, we're going to have episodes for um we're gonna we're gonna do like end of the year list episodes i believe for for john and maggie and for me and steve we're each gonna do one where we pick like random topics like maybe best horror movies best kills best trailers best music cues things like that and then for the other two episodes each group is going to do their top three movies of 2023 so you have a lot to look forward to and then the week after we're into most anticipated of 2024. So we have you well covered all through the holidays, but that's next week. We're back tomorrow. We'll see you <laughs> right here tomorrow, 10 a.m. Pacific. Have a good one, everyone.